I'm going to ask Chris to, uh, <laughs> she's just sat down, to come and read our scripture text this morning. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world in Canada, in Midway, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the people in your community that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God and honor the king. Oh, Lord God, thank you for this morning. And as we come to your word, as we come to your heart, uh, help us. We need you. You know how we like to um, put fences around your words. <laughs> we want to be justified in our how we understand your words. To make ourselves more comfortable to make ourselves right. But your word is not there to make us right. Your word is there to make us like you, that we might develop your heart. And we are on this journey, Father, of having our heart be transformed by you. And we've got so many areas of our lives that are just hidden from you or kept in a locked away from you. Oh, that we might, by your spirit, that we might say, Lord, you know me, you know what's going on. May I be willing to let you in to those areas, to what you are wanting to say to me today and in the days ahead. Because the word submit. has been so easily usurped, so easily abused. We ask for your grace and your mercy. And specifically that we might understand who we are in Christ more and more. So come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preface this by saying... Um, we were going to cover uh, the the ruling submission to authorities or rulers today, and we're not going to get there. 
So just just give that up. I gave it up, and um, and, and and again, I will say this: it's because I feel so strongly about the need for grounding, the need that we be grounded in who we are, in what God has done. Um, that we keep coming back to that, and I couldn't get away from that this week. So um, last week we looked at this um, four-letter word. What is often seen as a swear word. Submit. Submit. We read it in Psalm 81. If only they, my people, would submit to me. And it's in, as we learned last week in this text, it's used by Peter more than anyone else in the New Testament. So the question is, how is this done? Because, let's face it, as soon as the word is mentioned, I mean, did anyone, when I said that word, go, oh, good, oh, oh, that's so nice. Did anyone? No? And yet, if I were to say, how many of you, for whatever reason, when you hear that word, you tend to put a fence up, wall up, you pull back, there's a pause in your spirit. I don't think anyone here, when they hear the word submit, exuberantly declares, yep, I get to submit. Woo Dare I say it even that you don't even do that, I think, with God. I don't know. It's interesting. Like, I think, I think we tend to avoid that word even with God, right? I want to love God. I want to trust. Trust, trust is a nice kind of a word. I want to follow. But submit, that's just harsh. And yet, Scripture clearly, very clearly, shows the importance and the priority of submission. Of course, the issue is one of trust. If I don't trust you, why would I submit to you? Right? I mean, isn't that the whole issue today that's all over the place? I don't care what position you take. The issue is one of trust. I don't trust what they are saying. I trust what they are saying. And who can we trust these days? Really, who can we trust? And the answer is God. That is God the Father, Jesus Christ, His Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is where Peter begins his letter. He introduces himself. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he tells us who his recipients are, that they are the chosen exiles of the diaspora of, in this area is the, um, just a second, let me just move that over there. This area is around Turkey. And then he declares that his listeners, the ones he's writing to, are chosen. Yeah. Okay, let's do this here. Ooh, okay, let's do oh, great. Um, just a second. There we go. Okay, now it should work. Let's see, yeah. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So God is in on this from the beginning, before time, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and for obedience to Jesus Christ. Right off the bat, the, the gate, right from the gate, get go, whatever it is, the phrase is. He wants us to know that the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are in on this. That we can trust God the Father, God the Spirit, and God Jesus Christ. He then goes on to say, why? Why can we trust the Trinity?
because of who we have become through Jesus Christ, chosen by God to be his children. And as his children, we are not only chosen, he tells us that we are a priest. We are priests. I, I, for those of us who grew up in the church and different kinds of churches, maybe even more liturgical, of course, we think priest as robe, collar, priest, training, all kinds of things that might come to our minds. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about us. That we who trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior are priests. So let's just do that together. Okay, back to, I want you to repeat back to me. Um, as a believer in Jesus Christ, just say, I am a priest. I am God's priest. Okay. We are, so what is a priest? You just said you were a priest. What's a priest? That is, we are God's representative in regards to life and death matters. That's what a priest did, right? He was a mediator between God and man. God has the final say, he'll speak, so to speak. And, and so he mediated between God and man in matters of life and death. And sin was a significant part of that, wasn't it? But we are not just priests. We are royal priests. That is, we also represent the king. And we do not live for ourselves, but we live for the king. Our loyalty, our allegiance, our devotion, our very lives are given to serve the king. It's one thing to have to give your allegiance to, as a, to the king, or it's another thing to have to give your allegiance as a priest, but these are together. Like, you can't get any more comprehensive than that. And thus, Peter says, we are a holy nation. And the nation we belong to is not Rome or Canada or the U.S. or anywhere else. But the kingdom of God. And we are not just citizens of God's kingdom. We are God's special possession. As Aaron said, it's hard to bring out, we are his pride and joy, whom he takes great delight in. And all this, all this, so that we may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That our lives, that all that we are, every encounter with people, every thought, every action, how we spend our money, everything, that we may proclaim, may declare, may reveal who God is. That your life may result in people praising God for his mighty acts in your life in history. God. God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God who called you and you and you who called us. And once Peter says you were not a people. Once you didn't belong, but now because of God you do belong, you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. This is our basis for trust. This is our basis for submission. Like it, it's so comprehensive. It expands all of time. It expands our life. 
God can be trusted. And as we learned last week, he calls us to submit ourselves, to place ourselves under his care. So, he has spent all this time trying to hammer in, trying to hammer home who we are because of Jesus. And all of this is for purposes of helping us understand that because, dear beloved, I urge you as refugees and exiles to abstain. So first off, refugees and exiles. I was at the mall on Friday, and every time I go to Kelowna, I encounter this. Because of the war in Ukraine, I, I do not go to Kelowna, specifically to the mall, without walking by. I, I can see them, first off. I'm Ukrainian. I know what it looks like. <laughs> I, can, I just sort of know what they look like. I don't know why, but I do. And, and I think, oh, there's, there's a new immigrant family. And sure enough, as I walk past them, I hear them speaking Ukrainian. And the thing about... refugees is they stick out. I was talking to someone else um, from another country who's moved here and has been here for seven years. And his comment to me was, we still feel like people look at us differently. We don't belong. Now, if you talk to some of the Ukrainian people, they'd be glad they're here in the sense of there's more opportunity here. At the same time, and, and my, um, my nephew married a Ukrainian girl from Ukraine, and her parents have now come here as well as the son, I think, he's has moved. Back. He's, he's sorry? He's, he's gone, gone back. back. So um, they're thankful to be here, but they miss home. Home is home. And the people that Peter is writing to were, by all accounts, actual refugees and exiles. Both speak of people who have been forced, for whatever reason, to leave the home they know and to go to a strange place and to live there. In this case, it is believed that these were probably the people who lived in Rome. And because of Crestus, so there's an ancient text on that. Because of Crestus, they were told to leave. Crestus, of course, is a form of Christus, Christos, which is Greek for Christ. And, and so they were forced to leave their homes. And by the way, when you left, of course, it's not like you get to sell your house and take all your investments and run with you. You pack up whatever you have and you leave. Whatever you can. Whatever you can, exactly. And you're gone. And so not only are you having to leave home, you're having to start again. And then you stick out in your new land. And that was the experience here. So there was a very real sense of alienation. They were already different to begin with. But then there was their faith, their belief in this Crestus person. And we're going to look at that a bit later as to what that, just how weird that was next week, hopefully. Um, but I don't know if you know it. I mean, maybe if you grew up as a Christian all your life, you don't know it. But we Christians are weird. We have some really weird practices. One of which is that back then, when this first happened, when they first broke bread together, the rumor in the community, the belief, the storyline in the, in in town, so to speak, was that we actually did eat flesh and blood. 
that Christians were cannibals. <clears throat> and so we have these people who are feeling strange and different and weird, and, and they're, they're in this weird country, and they're feeling pressure to fit into their new situation, and their faith, that what they believe is coming at odds against that. And Peter is writing to them. That's why he's established who they are. He's saying, listen, you are refugees. You are exiles. You are citizens of another country, not because you're moved from Rome, but because you are members of the kingdom of God. Your home is in God's kingdom. And the issue is that you're going countering ways to fit in. You're wanting to, to fit into what's going on. And, and you've lost so much. And you're just thinking, I've got, how am I going to, how do I make it? And the, the pressures, the passions, the, th there's a lot going on. And you wonder, is this worth it? Is this following Jesus worth it? And Peter wants them to know that I urge you as refugees and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. And I love the fact that he uses the word soul here. Because the word soul means the whole of our body. It's an it's a integrative. It, we are whole people. And so this week when I sliced my finger here in a frustrating way and it's been bugging me all week and it doesn't really affect the rest of my life, but it has. At the most in top opportune times, I, I go like that. Ah! And, 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 and it's caused me to focus on it. And, and this is minor example, but <laughs> trust me, it's a really minor example. But it, it's real. It's real. Okay. So all I'm saying is that, listen, there are choices, there are decisions. Everything we do impacts who we are. And Peter's concern is that they will lose who they are in Christ in the midst of the pressures they find themselves in. That they will give in And he says, listen, you need to get back, continue getting back to who you are in Christ, that you are citizens of the kingdom of God. And so he says, keep your conduct. Okay, conduct is the word, the, your manner of living, the way you live, the way you walk, the way you conduct yourself, everything you do. Among the Gentiles, honorable. Now, you need to understand something that we so often want to characterize society as you're either good or you're evil, right? Um, or, and we want to make everything very much black and white. And scripture does that as well, by the way. But it also recognizes that there is, it's not as clean as that. In fact, as the, because of the Greek influence in, in the times that the scriptures were written, they had actually some really good perspectives on what it meant to live this life. So not everything was evil, not everything was terrible, but that didn't mean that it was all good either. And this is part of the process of when Paul, Peter, I should say, says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, what he's saying is, listen, where there are points in which there is good things going on, you can celebrate that. But when there are times where there, when it, the culture, the pressure, the, the, the lusts, whatever it might be, want to draw you away from your citizenship in heaven, that is where you need to stand. 
That's where you need to live as a person of Jesus Christ. But his heart desire right now, he's laying the foundation of what it's going to look like to submit in this culture. And he says, among the gent keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. In other words, they may not understand why you drink blood and sacrifice, eat flesh, but they will know that you are a person of upright character, that your word is your word, that you follow Christos, you, who you don't know who he, that person is, and it sounds really strange what you're doing, but they follow and they hold on to him in the midst of all that this difficulties they have. here. Peter is calling his readers, his listeners, it's more like it, to, to live the way of Christ. And when those ways go against what their society is saying to be willing to graciously um, endure and you know what i was going to say is endure the cross and that's what peter's going to be doing he's going to be saying listen you are called to graciously endure the grief that you will encounter in society the misunderstanding that you'll encounter in society the alienation that you'll encounter because of your faith, because of Jesus. Just as your leader, Jesus Christ, endured the cross, just as he was rejected, just as he was despised, just as he was forsaken. This is the path you are called to. You see, Peter is going to be arguing not a withdrawal from or a rebellion to. Those are the two responses that we often do as Christians. We want to withdraw from the big bad world, evil world, or we want to rebel against it. And he is does not advise either of those. He says the roles of society that we as Christians find ourselves in, that we are called to conduct ourselves in the way of Christ within those relationships. And so we're going to be exploring that in the next couple of weeks as we look at it in terms of the government, in terms of um slaves or work relationships, and in terms of marital relationships. But I wanted to, part of the reason I wanted to pause here is because I'd like us to just take some time to pray. We're encountering a fair, we've come from a, an interesting week locally. We're entering another very interesting week. And I don't, I don't want to politicize anything. I want to do what we are called to do, which is to pray for those in leadership. I want us to pray as children of God's kingdom, who is over all and through all and in all. That's just not North America. It's, it's all that's going on in this world. There are so many 
things going on. And what makes it harder is the fact that we have access to that information. We also have access to the different ideas of what this, that information means. So we need prayer. That we would have the heart of God in all of this. So I would like us to take some time to pray. And I'm asking... Um, I would just like us to do it. We're not going to use the microphone. I will use the microphone, but I will ask someone to just stand up, pray, sit down, pray. I don't care. Just pray. And, and then if several of us could do that, to pray for this next week, to pray for our, our nation, our province, our North America, for the world. Let his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Pray for us.